Well, good morning to you, and I uh, hope you are ready to continue journey through the book of Exodus, which is amazing. So much gold wrapped up in this. These stories that we've heard about since we were kids in Sunday school, or uh, maybe they're stories that you heard somewhere, but there's so much more to them when you dig in and you find the gold. And so I'm going to try and get through chapter 9 and chapter 10 today. We did two chapters yesterday. Uh, I want to keep the flow going again today. I'll try and do it as as uh, expeditiously as I can. Thanks, Dan Musselman, for the newly released music. If you haven't uh, checked out Dan's latest release, go and listen to that on YouTube. Uh, Dan Musselman. Uh, literally millions of people have been blessed by Dan's music. Thank you, Dan, for your kind use of this music uh, each morning as we listen to, to, to God's Word. So let's get into chapter 9 of Exodus, which is... Uh, where the plagues are about to continue, but they're about to go to a whole nother level, okay? Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and tell him, thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. So firstly, God says, hey, children of Israel, they belong to me, not you, my friend. Secondly, it's clear that God wanted uh, Pharaoh to let the children of Israel go for the sake of God himself, not just for the sake of the people. Pharaoh was responsible to treat Israel well for the sake of the Lord, not just treating them well for the sake of Israel. Um, and in the same way, we have to treat each other well, not just for the sake of each other, but for the sake of the Lord. Uh, we owe it to God to treat people nicely more than we owe it to them. And I think that's a very important fact that we can get out of Exodus chapter 9, verse 1. Okay, let's get into verse 2. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will be on your cattle in the field, on the horses, donkeys, camels, oxen, sheep, a very severe pestilence. And the Lord will make a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel. Then the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. So the Lord did this thing on the next day, and all the livestock of Egypt died, but of the livestock of the children of Israel, none died. Now this plague was directed against the Egyptian god Hathor, uh, who was the mother goddess in a form of a cow. Not only that, but in Egyptian religion, they considered cattle to be sacred, uh, and the cow was actually a symbol of fertility. Um, so God's saying, I'm greater than anything that you try, uh, that you, you want to try and do or any God that you've got. Verse seven, then Pharaoh sent and indeed not even one of the livestock of the Israelites was dead, but the heart of Pharaoh became hard and he did not let the people go. So the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take for yourselves handfuls of ashes from a furnace. Let Moses scatter it toward the heavens in the sight of Pharaoh. Okay. And it will become fine dust in all the land of Egypt, and it will cause boils that break out in sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, this was the third plague in this second set of three. And this plague therefore came without warning. This time God chose not to mercifully give Pharaoh a previous opportunity to turn around. Okay, he didn't do that. Then they took the ashes from the furnace. They stood before Pharaoh. Moses scattered them towards heaven and they caused boils that break out in sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were on the magicians and all the Egyptians. This was uh, directed against the Egyptian god uh, Imhotep. Uh, he was the god of medicine, and uh, which is interesting because God's saying, hey, uh, those people that are closest to the Egyptian gods that can heal people, I've given them the plague and they can't heal themselves. I'm always going to be greater. This is God. I'm always going to be greater. Verse 12, But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Very important verse. Why? Here for the first time, the Lord specifically hardens Pharaoh's heart. Um, six times before, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And what God was doing was hardening Pharaoh's heart by strengthening the hate that was already in him. And I think the moral of this is that God hardens those who harden themselves. 
That's why you see people who are so doggedly determined to be anti-God and you're like, man, they just need a miracle to break through. Yes, because they're like Pharaoh. They've hardened, they've made a choice to harden and then God has allowed that hardening to go even further because that's all that was in them. And it's really just a result of the disobedience of God's divine appeal to their heart. Um, the plagues were actually intended by God to soften Pharaoh so that he would be like, oh, you know what, there's no point. I just got to give in. But, but that's human nature came out in Pharaoh as it does in so many of us. Uh, for this time, I will send all my plagues to your very heart and on your servants, on your people, that you may know there is none like me in all the earth. Um, God's saying, as bad as it's been up until now, um, you haven't seen anything yet. Now, if I had stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, then you would have been cut off from the earth. But indeed, for this purpose, I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. As yet you exalt yourself against my people in that you will not let them go. Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause very heavy hail to rain down such as not been had in Egypt since its founding until now. Therefore, send now, gather your livestock and all that you have in the field. For the hail shall come down on every man and every animal which is found in the field and is not brought home and they shall die. He who feared the word of the Lord amongst the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his livestock flee to the houses. So God invites Pharaoh and the Egyptians to, to trust him by recommending to them, go and get all, go and get all your animals, okay? Um, because there's a plague coming. I mean, he's showing mercy here. And some of Pharaoh's household actually took the advice and went, okay, we're going to do that. Um, but others did not. He who did not regard the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. And the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards heaven that they, there may be hail in all the land of Egypt on man, beast, and on every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. Moses stretched out his rod towards heaven and the Lord sent thunder and hail. Fire darted to the ground and the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. This is actually a very interesting verse, okay? There is a lot in, in, in this so there was hail and fire mingled with hail, so very heavy that there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. Okay, these two verses. Fire was mingled with water, okay? You gotta think about that, okay? Nothing was said about fire, but then fire was mingled with it. Two things that should never go together, fire and water. I mean, that one should put out the other. Um, the Egyptians must have believed that there could be no more worse wrath of God. Uh, and what a strange, what a strange mixture, a miracle within a miracle. Fire and water making peace between themselves as they're falling out of heaven, that they obey the will of the Creator. That just blows my mind. I can't imagine what the conversations the Egyptians must have had watching fire and water come out of heaven at the same time. Um, then the hail struck throughout the whole land of Egypt, and that was in, in that. All that was in the field, both man and beast, the hail struck every herb of the field, broke every tree of the field. Uh, this plague was directed against the Egypt, uh, several Egyptian gods, but no, most notably the god of Nut, or Nut, N-U-T, which was the sky goddess. Only the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. So God looked after his people one more time. Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous and my people are wicked. I'm being a little sarcastic because Pharaoh was obviously not sincere. He was grieved at the consequences of sin. He was not grieved by the sin itself. This is how so many Christians live. They get grieved when they're caught out by the consequences of their sin, but then they'll just go and do it again tomorrow because they're not grieved at the sin itself. Verse 28, Pharaoh says, Entreat the Lord that there may be no more mighty thundering and hail, for it is enough, and I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. Moses said to him, As soon as I have gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands to the Lord, that the thunder will cease, and there will be no more hail, that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know you will not yet fear the Lord God. Moses' response to Pharaoh uh, showed that he was starting to learn and discern Pharaoh's heart. He knew that the promise 
uh, to touch Pharaoh's firstborn had not yet been fulfilled. That was what was talked about in Exodus chapter 4. He knew what was coming. Um, now the flax and the barley, this is a little interesting passage we're about to read. The flax and the barley were struck, for the barley was in the head, the flax was in the bud, but the wheat and the spelt were not struck, for they are late crops. Okay, let me just tell you what that means. What that means is that just the head of the wheat was destroyed, but the stalk was still growing. In other words, God didn't decimate everything. Okay, that was about to come later. So God still left a little in the bag. Okay, he destroyed like the head of the wheat, but not the wheat stalk. Okay, um, and we, that, that comes into play in chapter 10. God's always got a plan. There's always reasons why there's verses in the Bible. You're like, I don't understand this barley and flax and budding and spelt. What is all that? There's always a reason. Always a reason. Moses went out from the city of Pharaoh, spread his hands to the Lord, thunder, uh, and the hail ceased, and the rain was not poured on the earth. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain, the hail, the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet more. And he hardened his heart, he and his servants. Let me tell you that hardening your heart towards God is a sin and then failing to repent when God graciously, graciously answers your plea is also a sin, okay? So the heart of Pharaoh was hard. Neither would he let the children of Israel go as the Lord had spoken by Moses. Let's go straight into chapter 10. Now the Lord said to Moses, go in to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine before him. Uh, in hardening Pharaoh's heart, God allowed him to have what he actually sinfully desired, which was a hard heart against God and against God's people. And that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your son's son, the mighty things I have done in Egypt and my signs which I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. Very important. God does mighty works among us so that we can encourage the generations to come. The same way people we know speak about what God did in the war, the same reason we read people like Corrie Ten Boom's book, The Hiding Place, and we're, we're encouraged by it generations later. God will, people will be encouraged by how we handle this situation right now how much we trust God. That's the story we're going to tell our children and our children and children. That what story are we going to tell them? You, you can write the narrative right now. So Moses and Aaron came into Pharaoh and they said to him, Thus says the Lord God of Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. God warned Pharaoh to humble himself. Or the worst plague lo locust is about to come. Pride was the heart of Pharaoh's problem. He just did not want to give in to God. And it's an important question that we have to all ask anyone is, how long will I refuse to humble myself before God? Or else, if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory. They shall cover the face of the earth so that no one will be able to see the earth. They shall eat the residue of what is left, which remains to you from the hail. They shall eat every tree which grows up for you out of the field. This was what was left over from the previous. This is the barley and the flax, okay? This is like, God said, I left it for you. Okay, now I'm taking it all away. Verse six, they shall fill your houses, the houses of all your servants, the houses of all the Egyptians, which neither your fathers nor your fathers' fathers have seen since the day that they were on the earth to this day. And he turned and he went out from Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh's servant said to him, how long shall this man be a snare and a problem to us? Let the people go, let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not know that Egypt is totally destroyed? Can you not see what's going on? They're like, are you blind, Pharaoh? Moses and Aaron were brought to Pharaoh and he said, and go serve the Lord your God. Who are the ones that are going? Who will go? Very interesting. Um, Pharaoh wanted again to bargain with God. He wanted, to some, he wanted to allow some to go into the wilderness and worship, but he wanted to keep the children and women as hostages. So Moses responds, he says, we will go with our young, with our old, with our sons, with our daughters, with our flocks, with our herds, we will go. We must hold a feast to the Lord. Moses re totally rejected Pharaoh's compromise. Um, God wasn't going to bargain with Pharaoh. Why? Because he didn't need to. This time, every time, God always holds the negotiating leverage. What Pharaoh wanted is what many of us want in the flesh. This is a, an acceptable way to give in to God and save face. 
without fully submitting to him. And, and, and sometimes I think we try to look at bargaining with God as if he's an equal. Instead of understanding he's the creator of the universe, he's Lord, just submit to him. Come under his plan for your life because he loves you. He cares for you. He's a father. Then he said to them, the Lord had better be with you when I let you and your little ones go. Beware for evil is ahead of you. He's threatening Moses now. Not so. Go now, you who are men, serve the Lord. For that is what you desired. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his rod over the land of Egypt. And the Lord brought an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. And the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt. They rested on all the territory of Egypt, billions of them. They were very severe. Previously, there had been no such locusts as they, nor shall there be such after them. For they covered the face of the whole earth. So the land was darkened and they ate every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. And so there remained nothing green on the trees or on the plants of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. God showed himself greater than the Egyptian God Set, S-E-T, who was the protector of the crops. And there remained nothing green. God did for Pharaoh what he will do in our lives, which is expose and topple every false god. See, I think when we trust in those little gods in our in ourselves, um, it actually hurts us when they fall. Um, but it's, I think it's always better to have them exposed, just so you can move on. So you can move on. Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste, and he said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now, therefore, please forgive my sin only this once and entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. So he went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. And the Lord turned a very strong west wind, which took the locusts away and blew them into the Red Sea. And there remained not one locust in all the territory of Egypt. The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart again. And he did not let the children of Israel go. And the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt. Darkness which may even be felt. This is a supernatural darkness. This is not just the absence of light, okay? Um, now, you have to remember, this is, the, this is the, the, the third in this set of plagues, so it comes without any warning, and it's no normal darkness. See, light is not only a physical property. It's an aspect of God's character. 1 John 1 says, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. In judgment, God can uh, withdraw his presence so significantly that, the, that what's left is darkness which can actually be physically felt. That's got to be scary, to be honest with you. And uh, seemingly, God didn't even allow artificial light sources to work. The Egyptians, they tried to use candles, they tried to use lamps, they couldn't even produce light to see each other. It was a dramatic show of greatness. Now, who was this one aimed at? The Egyptian god Ra, thought to be the sun god. And when we come, when you come to Egypt with me, and we go to Cairo and you can see all the, uh, the, the Ra gods everywhere, uh, which is who, who the uh, Egyptian pharaohs thought that they were actually becoming. There you go. So now you've got to come to Israel and Egypt with me. Um, verse 22. Uh, so Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, the thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. And they did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel, they had light in their dwellings. Yeah, oh, fine. They got candles working. Can you imagine what that must have looked like as they were looking at the suburb of Goshen? They're like, this. They're... Well, they couldn't see it, obviously, because it was supernatural darkness. But how amazing would that have looked if you could have been able to actually see the darkness and then, and then this area of light? It's just mind-blowing to think about visualizing what it would have looked like. Verse 24, then Pharaoh called Moses and he said, go serve your Lord, only let your flocks and your herds be kept back. Let your little ones also go with you. So here we go. He's making his last 
bargaining offer. He's still bargaining with God. He still thinks he can bargain with God. Now he's saying, okay, you can let all the people go, but you can't take all your animals, okay? Uh, you have to leave them behind. Moses said, hey, you must give us sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice the Lord our God. In other words, we, we have to take the animals because that's the sacrifice. Our livestock also shall go with us, not a hoof shall be left behind. For we must take some of them to serve the Lord our God, and even we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. This is, this is a great verse in the Bible. See, um, God, through his prophet, showed that he was unwilling to compromise on anything. God, God wanted deliverance for all of Israel and all that belonged to Israel. He was not willing to deal on this. Um, and it reflects the response of God to every attempt that we make to surrender less than everything to him um, or to willingly leave some things in bondage. God says, not a hoof shall be left behind. You can't, you can't just give God a little bit. You can't even give God a lot. You have to give God everything. That's how it works. You can't bargain with God. Some of you today are watching this and you have been bargaining with God and you've got to stop it. You have to stop bargaining with God and you've got to get on board and your heart has got to be softened to say, God, I will give you everything and stop being stubborn for the things of you and start being stubborn for the things of God. Verse 27, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let them go. Pharaoh said to him, get away from me. Take heed to yourself. See my face no more. For in the day you shall see my face, you shall die. And Moses said, you have spoken well. I will never see your face again. Pharaoh didn't have a clue how true his words were. He didn't, he didn't realize that this was actually the end for him. Um, God sent these plagues upon Pharaoh in Egypt to answer Pharaoh's question. Who is this Lord that I should serve him? He sent the plagues to show his power through Moses. He sent the plagues to give the children of Israel a testimony that would last for generations. He sent the plagues to, to, to judge false gods. He sent the plagues to warn the nations. Think about the Philistines in 1 Samuel chapter 4, 400 years later. They said uh, that we remember the Lord who sent the plagues upon Egypt. So he used it as a warning to future enemies. And God sent these plagues as a testimony of the greatness of God to Israel. So what should or can we observe from this today? I'll tell you what I observe, okay? God always has a reason. God always has a plan. But it might be generations before that plan and those reasons are known. I'm probably not going to find out why God allowed the coronavirus in this season. I'm probably not going to find out why COVID-19 shut the whole world down. Maybe my children's children will find out and know about it. Okay. There's, look, it, it, there's, there's many people who could speculate right now and, and, and in the comments go, no, I can tell you why it is. Listen, you don't know. Okay. You don't know. God does know. You might have an idea, you might have a suspicion, you might have a, I don't know what. I tell you, I, it's, I find that it's so much simpler to live my life without trying to scratch for the reason for everything and just go, God's sovereign, he's in control, he knows, I'm good, I've got everything I need. My Philippians 4 is still real for me. My God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. I believe in that verse and so I'm going to continue to stand on it. God always has a reason. Don't be stubborn. Be all in for God. Don't bargain with him. Don't bargain with him. Whenever I've done that, I, I did that probably a, a lot when I was uh, in my early 20s, I would say. But I, I learned some pretty tough lessons. I don't do it anymore. I just don't. I, I, like God tells me to do something, I just do it. Now, that's because I've been on the planet for a long time and I've, I've had my times of stubbornness in my, myself. But uh, I, I think there's a reality to this season that we are in right now um, to follow the example of Moses. And as the plagues went on, Moses' faith became more bold. 
Pharaoh's heart grew harder and God knew that he ultimately would get the glory. That's what I observe. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. Help us. Help us, Lord, to, to not be, not to have a necessity to know everything. Why you let everything happen. Why you make things happen. Why you seemingly are okay with certain things and not others. God, let us just be okay with knowing that you are the Lord God. You're our protector. You're our father. You're our provider of everything that we need. And God, let's just have peace and comfort in that today. And God, not to uh, have a need to demand answers or to demand a right to bargain with you or, or to, to complain to you. But God, just a right to come to you and be loved by you and to know that great and mighty is the Lord. In your name I pray, amen.